Hi, everybody. It's Rob Shapiro from In the Mind Of. Today, I'm honored to, to have Jerry Hesch um, with me. Jerry Hesch is a physical therapist who is now in Colorado. Uh, Jerry and I met in 2006. A kind of interesting story, but I, I uh, you know, was online at the time and wanted to order his videos. And that's when they had those square rectangle things, videos. And Jerry called me. He goes, you can't order my video. You've never taken my course. And from there, we said, well, like, can I take it? He goes, well, I've had some issues I haven't been able to teach. So, you know, let's start. He sent me his book. We actually talked, literally, my kids were, they're 15, 16, 17 now. And so when they were, kids were like two or three years old, Tuesday or Thursday night, we would call at the time he was in Vegas. And uh, we would talk and go through the manual. And it was kind of interesting. Great way to learn. A couple of years later, went with a friend of mine, went out to visit him in, in Vegas. And I remember it's like meeting the Oz, you know, he came out, seeing somebody on the video and then actually hanging out with him and talking to him. Uh, found out he's a very, very interesting person, you know, enjoyed his company. And we just, we invited him to New York uh, to speak and to do a course for us um, at the company where my own prior to where I am now. And Jerry did a, you know, his first lecture in, our, in years and then has been teaching all over the country and a little over the world since then. But welcome, you know, thanks so much for joining me. I appreciate it. What did I miss in the intro? I kind of gave a, I know, like a 40 year career within three seconds. So anything it's more you want to give a little bit more? It's all good. Thank you. Yeah. How about what else? Tell me what, what is the hash method or what's, what, what are you, what are we doing? Like what's going on with the hash method? You know, you know, I struggle with that, that term, you know, you're supposed to die before something gets named after you. <laughs> and, and yet we have the issue of, I approach the pelvis differently than the tradition. So maybe we need some other terminology other than hash. I know it bothers some people and, you know, <laughs> prevents them from looking deeper into it. And, you know, it is what it is. But, but let, me say, let me explain that. When I was 17, I was in a life-altering motorcycle wreck. And um, so I certainly caused harm to my low back, my inguinal area, damaged three nerves there, um, damaged my pelvic joints. And after PT school, I actually got into PT school because I wanted to be a rolfer, but I wanted to be a well-educated rolfer. At that time, there was minimal requirements for studying that. And I wanted to do cadaver dissection back in 1979. So I ended up going to PT school. And in my first job out, I worked with Richard Dontigny, who was the most published physical therapist on the sacroiliac. As a matter of fact, in 1981, the first issue of Journal of Orthopedics and Sports Physical Therapy came out. And that very first issue was dedicated to the sacroiliac joint. And to just demonstrate that few people understand it, you know, it's complex biomechanics they had to do corrections to that first article. So the second issue had corrections to that first article. Um, and I only remember one of the author's name. It'll come to me later, so I won't say it. Um, I think it was, I, I'm gonna get it wrong, so I'm not gonna say that. But anyway, anyway. So I started working with Richard Dontigny, who had published the most number of articles in the PT profession. At that time, there were only a handful of articles on the topic of sacroiliac joint dysfunction. Well, I moved and my first job was up in Haver, Montana. I, I grew up in Santa Fe, lived in Albuquerque, where I went to PT school, and then went up and worked with Richard Dontigny. And of course, his approach was very confusing to me. His articles were confusing. You know, it took me a long time to understand that. Okay, well, we've learned a lot more since then, you know, so our models have changed. But anyway, I, what I read was that the SI joint is like a shock absorber. I also call it a force transducer. Um, just like the U joints in your car, they take the, the energy from the engine into the transmission and then down that long pipe that goes to the rear wheels if you have rear wheel drive and it changes, the differential changes the, the direction of movement so the rear wheels rotate okay so um anyway um i thought well if the joint is a shock absorber then i should test it the way that i test shock absorbers on my car and, and in order to do that you push down on the fender 
until it stops moving and you hold it there. So you've now loaded the shock absorber and then you add a thrust to cause it to spring downward and bounce back into your hand. And the recoil is important. So I started doing a couple of passive motion spring tests to the pelvis. At that time, there were none being done anywhere that I'm aware of, none in the literature. In the osteopathic work, there was one spring on the sacrum and it's very poorly defined. And I absolutely do not believe that they test the recoil, the bounce back. So I started doing those tests to the pelvis. Now in 1980, Nine, I believe, Richard Nyberg, who teaches for Stanley Paris's group and has a practice in Atlanta, Georgia, and he's, he's well published, um, did a chapter on an orthopedic PT textbook, and he listed a number of spring tests. I would assume he did at least six of them, maybe eight of them. Now, mine... My swing tests are a little bit different than his in terms of the direction, and I'm not going to elaborate at this time, but I now, in a basic evaluation of someone's low back and hip and pelvis, I utilize 16 passive spring tests. Um, in the course of treating the, the patient, I will do additional advanced spring tests. Now, realize that the SI joint only moves such a very, very small amount. So I call that micro movement. And a lot of clinicians are running away from the joint and saying, we're not gonna treat it because it, it only moves a little bit so that can't cause pain. Or it only moves a little bit and we can't measure that in the clinic so we have no purpose in, you know, in treating the SI joint. And um, my front door, it won't seal unless I, I close the door but then I have to push it a little bit extra to get it to seal. Otherwise, light comes through the crack, the insulation between the door and the door frame, okay? Well, any door, when you shut it fully, you should be able to still get this little tiny spring motion applied to it. And that's kind of how the pelvis is. We know that when the pelvis moves, and we see it and we, we see someone and say, your pelvis is not aligned and then they do something to it and then it becomes more symmetrical. We know that that most likely does not happen inside the SI joint, but a lot of people drank that Kool-Aid and I drank that Kool-Aid for sure. Okay, that comes to us from the 1958 osteopathic model written by Fred Mitchell Sr. titled Structural Pelvic Function 1958, Journal of American Osteopathic Association. His son, Fred Mitchell Jr., then in 1979, published the first uh, workbook on muscle energy technique and took that biomechanical model where the belief was when someone's pelvis is asymmetrical, it's coming from the SI joint. But study after study in stereophotogrammetry has taught us it only glides two millimeters at most in the average person, even symptomatic population, and only rotates up to two degrees, oftentimes less than that. But you can still feel that little tiny bit of micro motion when you do passive testing. So what is the value of doing the passive testing? I submit to you, and I have many, many cases on YouTube under my name, Jerry Hesh, spelled H-E, S like Sam, C-H, um, on YouTube, many, many videos where I demonstrate the spring test and I demonstrate case studies where I treat someone and I demonstrate how motion is blocked. And that's a very dis distinct feeling. Um, if I push on a vault door at a bank, it's not going to give it all. But if I take any door in your house and it's shut, I can still give that little tiny spring. Okay. So I do these tests in multiple directions through the pelvis. And the key concept is not that I'm isolating movement inside the SI joint, but I am allowing movement to go through the joint. And I truly believe that many times there's a restriction of movement going through it normally based on a postural aberration or a nervous system, you know, altering muscle tone. So when we feel blocked mo movement, oftentimes it's easy to restore that 
and people tend to feel better. It tends to reduce nociception, tends to restore normal. Right. So one of the things, sorry, one of the things to think about, I remember when we first, like, we teach people how to do, you know, in school, to make everybody does it. And when we, we, you and I spent some time together, we talked about spring with awareness, right? So that was like a whole thing to me. It's like everybody springs, but you had all these people do these big motions and not really feeling that pick up the slack end field type of thing and does it spring and that's so we kind of worked together the spring where awareness came out i thought that was an interesting way for me it was the most dramatic changes in my career for my ability to treat a joint and i and you know we first when i first learned it from you is more pelvis si but now we've kind of gone up and down the body and you know like subtalar joint you know oh it, uh, people go oh, it moves look at it and i'll go in and go pick up the slack there's no spring and I think if you could take, you know, I would say your legacy, you know, in my mind is the ability to, to get the word out. We all, everybody does springing in their mind, what they think is springing, right? We all do. We, in school, we do joint mobs. We're probably doing more like four minus, you know, those are big. We're not getting to the end. You know, if we go Maitland, we're, you know, we're not hitting the four plus plus type of thing. Or if you go into a column board, we're not taking up the slack, going to the end and taking the spring. And I think that's what's been huge for me. You know, and to teach it's been interesting because I, you know, I've watched you treat all these years, and it, you make it look effortless. And I have to remind students that, you know, what you're doing, and you know, by step by step, taking up the slack. He's really feeling the slack in the mind of, you know, and you get into the end, and you feel that little spring, and see how's it de springs. So it's been a game changer. You know, I think uh, a lot of people going through the you know, pelvic course and the rest of the body course. You know, it's been interesting over the last for me to see that over the last few years to kind of develop more of that work. Uh, so. And you, you coined that term springing with awareness. That was your terminology. Or we, yeah. And, and yeah, I think that, uh, the, I like that a very important aspect, a very important aspect of it is you have to slow it down a little bit. Okay, you can't right. just, just do a thrust to a joint. There's a wrong way and a right way and you are correct. When you take uh, structure and oftentimes the pelvic spring test the body weight kind of stabilizes the rest of the body and say you push on an ilium to a stop point then you stay there and you pause for a little tiny bit and then you add an additional thrust of about the same magnitude the same amount of force and then you spring it and you should allow you should feel it come backwards and you're still holding up the slack you're still taking up that initial movement so you're testing forward thrust and the recoil, and you have the ability to repeat that test. So it's not take up the slack, thrust, let go. It's take up the slack, thrust, and feel the bounce back. And what we call hypermobility states, um, oftentimes that recoil is slow. It's, it's delayed based on a normal spring. Uh, and we have right. case studies where people had fused SI joints and you can see how most is absolutely blocked with that spring test and no amount of treatment restores that movement. I had an interesting woman come to see me and she was pursuing a sacroiliac fusion back in 2010 when this new minimally invasive hardware for SI fusion had come onto the market and was being heavily marketed as it continues to be. Now there's 11 manufacturers of that fusion device, uh, minimally invasive. Anyway, I told her that her pelvis was, was fused already. There's no need to go forward and get a SI fusion because you're already fused and there's no motion in any direction on the left side or the right side, I don't remember, of her body, of her pelvis. Okay, so it's like me trying to push on a concrete wall. I couldn't take up the slack. So I looked at many, many CAT scan images and I showed her several images where she had scoliosis rods that extended all the way from the lower thoracic down to the overlying the sacrum. And on the left side, the rod was on the left side of the sacrum uh, away from the SI joint. On the right side of her body, the rod was off to the right a little bit and it impinged on the lower part of the SI joint. So we had an explanation as to why it didn't move. Um, other times I've found people who's joints are fused that they weren't aware of it, but they had an inflammatory arthritis and that explains it. Right. But I so want to say that, that most you know, of the uh, time, 
most yeah. people, when you have block mobility with those testing. So I was gonna say, where do you, you know, as a student coming in, where do you start? Like, you know, you always start pelvis and the rest of the body. How, do, how would you tell a therapist, how do I know where to go? The body's pretty big. Like, how do I know it? We have stiffness in the low back. Do I go right to the pelvis? Do you go to the feet? Do you go to the OA? What do you, uh, how do you determine? Yeah, it's a challenging question, okay? <laughs> so, you know, yes, you could go symptom-based, but I'm a real fan of treating the whole body. And let me give an example. The writing reflex is powerful. Um, if someone has a lower body rotation that's not their norm, let's say through trauma, I lose transverse plane rotation in my subtalar joint. Well, then there's a reflex that the easiest place for the body to compensate for that is at C1, because C1 is like a donut. donut. It rotates on C1 almost 45 degrees left and 45 degrees right. And there's only the weight of the head acting on C1. And so that's an easy place for the body to, uh, in terms of energy efficiency, compensate. So if I lose transverse plane rotation um, in my in my subtalar joint, such that lower body is basically oriented a little bit to the left, then upper cervical C1 is gonna counter rotate to the right. And that has to do with keeping our eyes horizontal and maybe it has to do with trying to equalize uh, blood perfusion to the brain. So if, if one of those persons, you know, you try and treat their suboccipitals, you're not gonna succeed because it's driven reflexively. You can't undo that. You have to go treat the cause, which is the subtalar. So the quick answer to your question is, I do treat the whole body. I do screen the whole body. And there's an example of why for someone with maybe, uh, you know, uh, cerv cervicogenic headaches, maybe you want to look at the foot. Um, yeah. So the question is, where do I start? I start at the foot and work my way all the way up. Right. So do you have, what's coming up? Do you have anything? I know with everything going on, you were going to travel to see us. And that was coming up. I'm not sure when, but I'm not sure what the yeah, I future hope, plans are. Anything? I hope, yeah. I hope we can still do June 13 and 14 in Manhattan for the whole body course. I hope that right. that happens. And are you teaching out a little bit out west too? Are you still doing, or is that well, done? I something? I'm supposed to do one in Denver and everything's on hold. So I haven't heard back from the university if they will approve that or not. Uh, okay. We're supposed to, you know, so uh, we'll be in Chicago end of July, and hmm. hopefully, hopefully things will be picking up. Now, do you have that stuff on your website? If anybody wanted to find out oh, yeah. about the courses, yeah, yeah. I know we have yours for our website. Do you have anything on your website? Yes, I do. Yeah, Hess Institute website, uh, spelled H E S like okay. Sam, C H. Right. The cool thing about that website, it's also like a little bit of a library. I go through it, or you know, stuff that you've written. It's kind of fun to kind of play play through it. There's tons of fun Jerryisms and Hessisms and all that kind of stuff. So it's, it's a form of torture. I appreciate the, yeah. So I definitely appreciate the time. Anything else you want to share with us before we, uh, well, um, we pop off? Again, much of this pelvic asymmetry is not happening in the SI joint. You know, right. and, and we have to be very careful because you get on Facebook and you look at those SI support groups and those people are being told by clinicians that their SI joint is out of place. And that creates a lot of fear. And then they feel like they mm -hmm. have to go get their SI joints fused. Okay. It's a real problem. I treated a 30-year-old occupational therapist in Albuquerque about uh, in March, early March. And she was very emotionally labile uh, because, because she couldn't get her pelvis straightened out. Okay, and she did have some low back pain along with that, but she'd seen 10 different practitioners and they were all aligning her pelvis. Okay, right. well, I evaluated her with the sprain test and such, and I said, your pelvic, your pelvis moves completely normally, your hip moves completely normally, your pelvis developed asymmetrically. After your injury, people, clinicians brought your awareness to your pelvis. And so now every day you look in the mirror and you see an uneven pelvis. You're made that way at the factory and it's not a problem. 
It doesn't mean you're weak. Your one bone grew bigger than the other. So I showed her in sitting, she can sit on a piece of craft foam and then she feels more comfortable in sitting because otherwise the seat right. force an asymmetrical pelvis into false symmetry. So it was an education process and I didn't know if I reached her or not, but the next day she came back, she was happier and she said, I understand my pelvis is developed asymmetrically and I'm not going to go see people to try to get this aligned. That's so, perfect, right? Yeah, so we have yeah. to be really careful with our interactions out there. And there's an awful lot of marketing for SIJ fusions. And that's a whole other topic. Let's schedule another mm. another conversation about the oh. issues with the pain provocation test and with SIJ injection. It's not, they are not gold standards. Good, yeah, that'll be our next, we'll have to have another session. Go ahead. Can I say one more thing, Rob? Sure. There's a, there's a lot of people that don't want to do hands-on care anymore. A lot of the pain science has kind of maybe encouraged that. I, you know, I still think there's a very valuable role in doing hands-on evaluation treatment. And I'm aware of the studies. I know about the intertestor reliability. I get all that. I've discussed that. I've debated that online. Um, in my model, I only do hands-on treatment on one visit. After that, there's a self-treatment to address that pattern. And number one, it's either resolved or the patient doing some very simple things will keep it at bay, will keep the motion normal. And I'll tell you one quick story. I wrote a researcher, a renowned researcher, because right now I'm working on a paper on side bent coccyx. So I asked him if he had any input because there's so little in the, in the literature. There are two imaging studies using MRI that describe side bent coccyx. And he wrote me back and he said, I'm causing disability in my patients by telling them they have a side bent coccyx. He's the second person mm. to tell me that. And I wrote back and I said, right. I resolve it in one visit. It takes 10 minutes. It's gone. And then the patient is educated in how to resolve that. And my 15 year old baseball player had, couldn't play, couldn't play baseball because he, he injured his coccyx. He, one visit, the next day he was back right. and went to the tournament. So I don't know mm -hmm. controversy in manual therapy where uh, some people are doing less of hands-on care and I think it's essential and I think it's very, helpful to a certain population. And we know complex pain is more complex than just moving a joint or restoring passive movement. But I think in treating the whole patient, we have to honor the patient's values and we have to still use our diagnostic skills. And we're not MRI machines. We are hands-on clinicians. It is what it is. And then the yeah, last- I agree. I mean, it's interesting. You know, putting those two together, it's like, think of it, it's like the whole biopsychosocial, which you've done. And, Interesting, I'm sure with you, treating the pelvic patient, that's a very psychological area to treat. So you have to have that. That's another skill. Skill set in itself is, you know, you combine the two together, powerful, powerful work, you know? Yes, yeah, yeah, very, very relevant. And then the very last thing I want to say is that we don't know everything about how joints function in the body. If you read my chapter on treating the atlanoaxial joint, you'll find that it's a very different trajectory than the majority of information out there on treating that joint. Most clinicians treat the atlanoaxial joint restoring rotation, okay? And only in a few small pockets of information will you find where evaluation is done in the sagittal plane in terms of this of C1 bending forward and bending backwards and gliding up and down the peg called the dens of C2. Um, so my book chapter is on treating that joint with distraction inflection. Um, and it can also get stuck the other direction less commonly. But we are still learning about how some joints function. And we Absolutely. can't claim that we know everything about how joints function that that was right. established years ago. That's those are my thoughts. Okay, very good. Yeah, we, you and I could talk for hours, so, but we're going to hold it here. I appreciate the time.
and I uh, always love speaking to you. It kind of keeps me thinking and uh, almost done with my doctorate, so I have my capstone. So maybe I'll do side bend sacrum, but I need more references. Yeah, anyway, we'll talk about be it. Be good. Take care. Thank Say you. Take Karen for me. Be Thank safe. you. And this is, family. this is Rob Shapiro from In the Mind Of. Have a good one. Take care. Bye-bye.